I agree far more with Matt Walsh's position on this than I agree with Blue Haired Lady, uh, obviously. Way more on Matt Walsh's side of things. But to me, it's, as you said, it's, I think it's just, it's just luck that he's sort of on the right side or the more of the right side of the issue. And Matt Walsh even did himself a, a disservice because he just tweeted out very recently that no one should be transitioning at all. Right. So now all the people can just say, oh, see, Matt Walsh's documentary is just concern trolling. It's all bullshit. He just doesn't want anyone to transition, blah, 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 blah. Science doesn't matter here. He's as ideologically possessed as the person he's sitting across from. That's why it's just, he's a terrible messenger well, for this. <laughs> Did you want to talk about the Matt Walsh documentary at all? We can. Is there anything you wanted to say about it that we didn't kind of briefly cover already? Mm, I mean, did you want to say anything? It sounds like maybe you do. Uh, I, let me think. I mean, I didn't like um, the fact that he brought up the, I mean, I'm af afraid to say it because the chat is just going <laughs> to... Yeah, the the uh, well, I mean, he brought up very briefly the um, what was it called? The uh, Loudoun County bathroom stuff. Yeah, and it's just, I this is this is a ter this is entirely my aesthetic, and I know and I understand why documentaries are set up this way. Like the documentary that I hate with a burning passion is Waiting for Superman. I don't know if you've ever seen that documentary. That's that documentary made me cry. Yeah, that documentary is 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 the height of evil emotional manipulation. Yeah. The kid is sitting there when right. I get into the school. Ah. Right. So that documentary is hilarious because it's made by some guy who's like pretty far on the left, and I think they worked on Al Gore's um, climate change documentary, and basically they're they're like a hypocrite because I think they live in New York, and instead of sending their kid to public school like a good uh liberal would you know a good lefty would uh they're like i gotta send my kid to a private school and they sort of felt this like weird psychological problem in their yeah. mind like i'm so against private schools i'm so against uh school vouchers and yet here i am not living my principles because i'm not sending my kid to private school so they basically created a documentary that's like two hours of cope for them to justify their own personal <laughs> decision that's the that's the story behind the movie. That's horrible. Well, that's how I that is. They talk about it in the movie. That's how I interpret. The oh, movie. you're Obviously, right. They, don't, they, do. they don't say that specifically. You're right. Um, they do. They totally bring it up. My big problem with the movie is so the movie's trying to address why there's so much problems with public schools in New York and America as a whole. And the big problem with why I say the documentary is evil and is dog shit is that they say okay, the reason that public schools are failing is because, and it's funny because they're on the left, they bring up you know the classic right-wing talking point uh, is because of the teachers union prevents bad teachers from being fired. It's, that's the claim they make. They say bad teachers can't be fired. And they bring up in the entire like two hour documentary, one only example. one data point, you know, one example, one fact to sort of to say, oh, here's this example of some situation in this one county where bad teachers are not fired. And then the rest of the documentary is just this emotional manipulative bullshit where they just show all these really sad stories of all these little, you know, adorable children who are in these school lotteries and they're just desperate to get out of, you know, whatever horrible low income school that's terrible that they're going to be shunted into and get to some nice private school, which is amazing. That's, and, and it's just, it's so fucking manipulative and it's so useless. It's so useless. There's n like no useful information in that fucking documentary. Now, uh, now I'm not, now the Matt Walsh documentary is nowhere near that level at all. Um, but, I like it's it's this the Matt Walsh documentary is more disappointing to me than bad. I'm not angry. I'm just disappointed because there was really useful and potentially useful parts of it. Like I love when he goes and he talks to doctors and psychologists and and the people that are basically performing surgeries or treatments and he's asking them hard questions. 
Like, that's what I want to see. And then when he talks to, like, the, the most powerful part in the documentary, and I'm kind of shocked he didn't do this more, was him talking to the trans man who was, like, like so angry and upset that he's, you know, he's had such negative outcomes uh, with transitioning. Right. And he and he rattles off so many different statistics. And I'm like, that's what I want. I want the data. I want the information. To me, that's persuasive. If they had checked, fact checked everything that that guy had said and been like, you know, Matt Walsh is like, here's all the, you know, all these studies show that, you know, uh, transition treatment is not effective or something. Assuming that's what the data shows. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe that's why it doesn't show it. But, you know, but too much of the documentary is spent on like, bullshit like it's him asking people on the street fucking random questions i don't care what random assholes on the street say i don't care you know he he flies out to africa well the reason some country in africa and asks people what their conception of gender is and like i don't care about it this is all so useless right and i guess i'm conflicted because i understand that to me it's so useless but i understand that to the average person watching it like that's what they like. They like all this like useless shit. Yes, yeah, it's meaningful to them. You elitist piece of shit. Well, it's not meaningful. It's persuasive, but it shouldn't be. Well, that's what meaningful means. I guess. But then I but then I question what is the point of the Matt Walsh documentary? Who is he trying cuz he's not the like, point of the Matt Walsh documentary mm -hmm. in case you didn't know. Is to get Republicans elected in the next well, election. Well, yes, but I mean, like, so obviously that documentary is not going to convince anyone on this line about anything. Of course not. Yeah, not um, Matt Walsh is not the person who is right. even capable of doing that. But the question is, if you showed that documentary to the average normie, yes, would it be persuasive? To yes, them? would it be effective? At it would be. Them? You think so? Okay, yeah. maybe. Yeah, I think it would be very mm -hmm. persuasive. I wonder. I don't think that many normies will see it though, and I guess that would be the, you know, the problem from that perspective. I see, man. I just, I see so much of this from the perspective of just a religion trying to take over everything. I mean, I just. I agree. I agree completely. All of that stuff in there just had religion written all over it. I never thought we would be living through. Mm -hmm. I mean, you read about the Crusades <laughs> and you think, oh, that'll never happen again. Oh, I guess it is happening again all around me. Yeah, no, like when you hear, you know, some of the therapists he's talking to talk, I mean, it's so obvious that they're consumed by a religion, by an ideology. There's no logic here no whatsoever and not but the problem is too is that like when he's talking to that one lady whose name i forget where he's like oh if i he's like he, he was asking her this question about assigned sex you know like oh you look at the baby and you look at the genitals and you assign the sex Which, what like, does she look like so we have a good beat the lady with about. the the big glasses and the brown hair okay who's kind of you know she's like in her 50s or something okay she and a, is she on our side or their side that's such a terrible way to... I, it is well you're about to find out okay. she was well she did something she was one of these like uh you know people who i don't think she performs the surgeries but i think she is like the therapist that like right. opens the door you know prescribes the surgeries or the hormones and he was saying does it make sense to say assigned sex because you're just observing it from the baby you know you're just observing the sex and he says like when i see a chicken lay an egg i know it's a chicken i'm not questioning whether it's a rooster and her response is like does a chicken cry that she, that woman is not <laughs> is wearing it, glasses is she i don't think she's i thought she glasses. was whatever and she regardless. has blue hair i don't remember brown okay. hair listen i'll be honest i was kind of listening i wasn't really watching okay okay um she's yeah, like does it she's obviously the most ideologically possessed in a religious way right yeah. yeah she's like this she's like do chickens cry and she kind of and i wish and i can't blame walsh too much for this because i would because really what she's saying when she says that is we should be 
denying reality to some extent in order to make people feel better. That's what she's signaling when she says that to chickens cry. That's what she's saying. Yeah, you're right. And he doesn't really pick up on that. But then it's just, it's frustrating because I, I want so desperately for the, to have conversations with these people who are, who are not just YouTubers, but are in these professional spaces and to like really get deep into these conversations, but they're so guarded. They're so unwilling to, because it, it's so defensive. Like they know that Matt is attacking them. Like if we had a conversation with these people, they know that we disagree with them. And so they're like, they're erecting all these walls. They can't talk openly and honestly about anything. Let's watch a little of that clip because then we can clip this out and we'll, people will have some context to it. Okay, is it in the trailer? I'm bringing it, I'm bringing it up, I found it. You just, you keep, you keep prattling on about <laughs> The one, here, you can talk about this. Matt what? Walsh, with the same person, turned the conversation to prescribing puberty blockers and he described them in a way that really, you know, hinted that she was doing harm to these kids. And she just was like distraught over that. You could see how distraught she was and how angry and triggered she got immediately at the mm -hmm. accusation. Which that, yeah, that's yeah. one of the things that make, makes it seem most religious to me is that, you know, it's... They cannot fathom that they could actually be doing harm to children. Well, that's what I, I mean. Which is fucking weird, is it, man. Is it possible to have like a real conversation with any of the people in this in this field without them being so hyper defensive? Well, there, I, you know, the thing that I thought about after watching the movie, mm -hmm. I thought about the thalidomide baby thing. Now, right. Sitch knows about this. For those of you who don't know, thalidomide was a, like a morning sickness drug that they gave to, uh, to pregnant women to deal with morning sickness. And it ended up resulting in a bunch of deformed births, deformed babies, which obviously is horrific. But I started thinking, I wonder how the doctors who prescribed thalidomide to their patients felt after that can mm -hmm. you imagine i know can you imagine like i'm the one that wrote the prescription for this shit right well see i wonder if you know i haven't had a lot of conversations with doctors about i know like i mean it's not true i know that most doctors are actually defensive in my experience if you do start questioning like Oh, of course. Um, yeah. You know, we talk to a lot of people for... Sorry, go ahead. I scared the fuck out of me. But uh, <laughs> yeah, a lot of doctors are defensive. But I wonder too, with, with, with a lot of the people that Walsh is talking to, is there some recognition in this conversation? Yeah, see, she has glasses. But yeah, you're right. She has blue hair. <laughs> um, that, that this is experimental. And that's why they're so defensive. Like they, there's some recognition on some unconscious level that there's a danger here that they're skirting. But that that was the thing about that moment in the movie that just you could tell. I mean, she's buried that way, way deep inside her her subconscious, and Matt mm -hmm. Walsh just brought it up to the surface in a way that she was not ready for. Yeah. Well, so, but I'm, I'm wondering if that's what's going on. Or I mean, I, I could be, I mean, I'm completely drawing this out of my ass. I have no yeah, we can't way read of mind, reading obviously. the this thoughts spe here. Speculation. Yeah. Completely speculation. Yeah. But You want to watch a little bit of this? Yeah, let's watch a little bit. Okay, of this. Here's, here's the interview. This is on Matt Walsh's channel, so we should be okay. Right. My name is Michelle Forcier, um, and I have a medical... Forcier, of course. <laughs> right a french name so it makes perfect sense wow gender okay. ideology all this didn't all this stuff come out of the it did like john luke leotard of damn what the fucking french postmodernist damn, damn perverted french herbert marcusa is aren't yeah. these all french names <laughs> yep 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 
medical degree from University of Connecticut Residency, University of Utah Pediatrics. And I've worked. See, that's what's scary. Fucking pediatrician. Mm -hmm. Pediatrician. Yeah. This is complete institutional capture. They've completely taken over. For a number yeah. of different Planned Parenthoods for 20 years. I do advanced contraception and abortion as well as gender hormones and sort of looking at the whole. <laughs> is he, she, she's like hitting every red flag. For so look, <laughs> she has blue. Flag. Not only is she transing your kids, she's aborting the babies. She's hitting, she's hitting like every single. She has, she has blue hair. <laughs> Oh my God, that's incredible. See, I wonder, but he, here's what I wonder. I hope this isn't a situation where like he went and found the most stereotypical people. Like, See, you don't I know. Hope, I don't trust I, Matt we Walsh. Don't know, right? Yeah, that's he, why. He could have had like very nuanced conversations with uh, doctors about these issues and just decided not to put them in. The problem, and I know many of you probably love Matt Walsh, because this is there, there's a bit of shot in for you in here that I'm not going to deny. So, mm -hmm. but the thing is, we're in a situation where the media is not giving us an accurate assessment. What Sitch right. and I want to know is if you dialed up a hundred therapists at random, are ninety percent of them going to be into this gender ideology, or is it going to be four? Right. 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 We kind of want to know the the. The reality of the situation. The problem with Matt Walsh is, you know, Matt Walsh could dial up a thousand of these therapists and only interview the four that he found, right? Right. Or he could interview a hundred and only show the, the four crazy yes. ones. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah, I mean, I don't, and I'm not saying he just what he did. I just, I don't know. Yeah, we don't know. Yeah, we would, we would like to know. I would like to mm -hmm. know. And I even, I almost said that because this is the point of the, interviewing the man on the street is because you want you want to give kind of a picture of what the common man where they are at with this stuff yeah but that doesn't yeah that could be good for just trying to figure out the temperature of something um, right. though that's going to be highly dependent on your location and also you're all not going to show the hundred interviews you're going to show like two you know, yeah the ones that you make the point that you want to make yeah you're sure. yes <laughs> yeah no so th that isn't even accurate Right, right. But. This is the whole point of doing survey work. You basically say, I asked a thousand people and you know, this is what they all said. Mm -hmm. And here's my estimation of the problem based well, on the scientific Well, then the problem data. is, um, what's that word for when people lie on polls that you talked about on Sunday? Preference falsification? Yeah, like I'm sure there's, I would wonder how much preference falsification would be going on with, if you asked like psychologists and psychiatrists about trans related questions i think and you took like a like a large poll of like american doctors i think government should control all health <laughs> <laughs> that's my that's gonna be my okay. standard response from now on it's a good that's a good i response. think everyone is transgender there you go Anyway, that's whole sort of schema of gender sex and, and reproductive um justice so you've done a lot of work in this field could you just start by telling us Sure. Uh, How the fuck you don't know who Matt Walsh is? Oh, I'm sorry. I interrupted. <laughs> Can you just start by telling us how you don't know you're sitting in front of <laughs> story, had, story transphobe Matt Walsh? They had to know, right? I mean, who would agree to an interview without Googling the interviewer first? This woman, obviously. <laughs> you think she doesn't know? Of course know. she can't know. I, I, she, that's the thing. That's actually a point in favor of Matt Walsh because Matt Walsh has such a reputation that, I mean, he, he probably had to get 50 trans affirming therapists before one would agree to interview with him. Yeah, maybe. Her internet must have been down this week. Uh, at what age can a child first begin to transition into another gender or identify themselves as a gender different from how they were born yeah well i mean there's there's research and data that show that um babies and infants um understand differences in gender some children figure <laughs> out their gender really early and the reason why we are say oh that's it's interesting or important is because they're figuring out their gender identity is not necessarily congruent with their sex assigned at birth when the when the doctor sees the penis and says this is a male 
has the sex of male, that's an arbitrary distinction. Telling that family based on that little penis. That tiny little ding dong. Why has it got to be little? I know. What if it's a big schlong? What if, what if it's that baby what if the is kids packing? like packing? Know. Yeah. Yeah. That your child. God, this is very, very sexist. Child is absolutely 100% male identified, no matter what else occurs in their life. That's not correct. So, what is gender affirmation care? You're a big proponent of. If we walk through yeah. a child is sitting down with you, is questioning yeah. their gender. What's the gender affirmation process? Affirmation means that as a pediatrician, as someone who says my job is to provide the best medical care for you, is I need to listen really carefully. And how I put it in words for kids so that they can understand it is tell me your story. Where have you been in terms of your gender and your gender identity? Where are you right now? And what psychologist is signing off on this? This goes against everything I have ever learned in psychology. Well, that was a good, it's funny because Jordan Pearson was so little in this documentary, but yet he says all the best parts of the documentary. Yeah, he does. And that's what he says. He says, you know, psychologists are not here to affirm anything that you say. Psychologists are here to get to the bottom of, of yeah, your what's issues. Happening. Yeah. Right. And, it, you know, he says, if someone comes into my practice and tells me what their problem is and why they have it, it's not my job to affirm it's, it's my job to get to the bottom of it. Right. And he's saying basically he, and I'm sure he's, this is based on his, you know, years of experience. And I'm sure almost every practicing psychologist would agree with this is that people are not, you know, they don't walk into your office and maybe if they, they have some idea of what's causing their problems, but they're probably not right. Yeah. They have no psychological training. They've never studied right. psychology. They don't know how the mind works. Exactly. They don't know any of this shit. Right. They're it, swinging in the dark. And that's part of the problem. I mean, part of the problem is that psychologists probably already had to deal with before a lot of the trans issues was that anyone can go look up now on the internet, you know, what is the criteria for some kind of medicine they want or right. treatment that they want. And they yeah. can just sort of try to regurgitate that to the therapist. And now you have that with trans issues. Very, I mean, it's very easily to be uh, coached on what to tell people. John Ronson is the funniest author. He the, in the psychopath test, he reads the DSM. It might be the four or the five or whatever, and mm -hmm. he says, "I was alarmed to discover that I had at least eight of the illnesses in, <laughs> in the DSM." It, as soon as you start reading that shit, you're like, "Well, that's kind of like what I have." <laughs> it's impossible. <laughs> we're we're like pattern rec recognition machines. Exactly, it's impossible. Exactly. You, if you want a clean diagnosis, you better stay away from that shit. Well, that's part of the problem. You know, they talk about with self-diagnosis is that it's very easy to start going over stuff and to see anything. And Similarities. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Yes. More excitingly, where would you like to be in the future? Have you ever met a four-year-old who believes in Santa Claus? Mm-hmm. So this is someone who believes that a fat man is traveling through the sky on a flying reindeer at lightning speed, coming down his chimney with presents. Yeah. <laughs> Would you say that this is someone who maybe has a tenuous grasp on reality? They have an appropriate four-year-old handle on the sure. reality Agreed. that's very real for them. Agreed. Agreed. But Santa Claus is real for them, but yeah. Santa Claus is not actually real. Yeah, well, and, but Santa Claus does deliver their Christmas presents. <laughs> well, yeah, but he's not real, oh, though. Nailed it. To that child, they are. This is such <laughs> a... Look at that. Look at that. How, so religious. To the child. This is such a bullshit answer to the child Santa's real. So who? Okay. Who, who the fuck cares? Yeah. It's, well, first of all, this is a bad example, I think, for Matt to even bring up. Because with the Santa Claus example, I mean, kids believe that because they're told to believe that from a trusting authority figure. I don't think this is exactly the best. Oh, you're right. Example yeah. to liken to, you know, should you trust kids' judgment, essentially. But did they I mean, have a, PDA, uh, a PhD in pediatrics? <laughs> yeah, right. No, but I mean, like, I think, I think a better example is, you know, very often there's small children who are like, oh, what do you want to be when you grow up? Oh, I want to be a dinosaur. Right. right. Or, you know. <laughs> I want to be, you know, something that's you're like, well, you can't be a dinosaur. Like, it's like, well, what do you mean? 
you know, or you know, something to that effect to me maybe would be a better uh, comparison than Santa Claus. He so. should have done the walrus. Then he'd have the product placement for his children. There you go. Book. Right. Exactly. Well, that's, yeah, that's why he had that book. He could have brought it in. Mm -hmm. That smile says it all. That smile says, that's right. I'm a dipshit. <laughs> well, she's like, she understands what he's trying to say. And she's, but that's the problem is that in a lot of these conversations, when, when it's like you're having a second level conversation, right? Oh, of course. So, you know, all the words are kind of meaningless because the real conversation is the conversation under the conversation. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. So because of that, she's not actually addressing his point. She's addressing the under point, which is so you get this ridiculous answer of like, well, you know, to the kid, Santa Claus is real. It's like, well, who gives a fuck what the kid thinks? That's irrelevant to reality. This kind of is a Tower of Babel situation where two people mm -hmm. just cannot. They're not equipped to speak to one another. Well, it's not Tower Babel. It's the problem is since it's a second, there's probably some real term that what we're discussing, but the problem is since it's a, since this is a second level, second tier sub conversation where both of them are really not talking about Santa Claus or talking about trans, you know, whether kids can identify as trans correctly or not. But since it's kind of under this guise, this framework of the Santa conversation, it makes it impossible. It makes it so that her answers are even crazier because she's trying to use the same logic that she would apply to trans kids, which maybe makes sense to some degree, which would make no sense to to apply to the Santa Claus uh, hypothetical. Yeah. So I mean, I guess if if you're what I would say is if you're in a conversation like this with someone, just just cut through the bullshit. Just say, well, let's not talk about this hypothetical. Let's just talk about the actual thing we want to talk about. Right. That's so many. That triggers them a lot, though. Obviously, if you're going to talk about sex and gender, that sometimes it's better to talk about some other thing that's not as triggering. Which I, I suspect that's why Matt went to the Santa Claus. Well, thing. no, he it's not why he he went to this example because he's trying to illustrate that it's an absurd position to basically trust children's uh, intuitions because right. what the hell does a four year old child know? Right. Yeah. And you're saying that they've been lied to by their parents. So obviously. Well, they, yeah, I'm saying it's not yeah. it's exactly the best example, but. I mean, it's a good example if you think about it because it shows that kids are very gullible and they'll accept anything right. that you it, tell them. If you're only trying to talk about, if the, if the only point is that kids can be convinced by their parents or by society to think they're trans at that young age, then that's definitely, then this would be a perfect example. Right. I don't think he goes there though. Right. Yeah. But I don't think that's exactly his point. I think his point is just, should we trust the self-identification yes. intuitions of a four-year-old? I think it's Obviously more, should, should we have faith in a society that would gaslight kids into believing in Santa Claus? They'll gaslight <laughs> them into believing anything, right? Okay. The point, but uh, <laughs> I'm assuming Matt Walsh tells us, you know, how does kids believe in Santa Claus? Oh, of course he does. Yeah. There's that's good fun. When you start showing up at the you know, at the gender reassignment <laughs> surgery for your four year old, I think maybe it's gone a little bit too far. Right. What do you want for Christmas, son? I'd like to be a girl. Okay. <laughs> we can do that. When I see a child who, you know, believes in Santa Claus and then let's say this is a boy and he says I'm a girl. Mm-hmm. This is someone who can't distinguish between fantasy and reality. So how could you take that as a reality? And well, uh, well I want to say two things. Uh, first, the Santa thing is, uh, is difficult because I don't like this was supposed to be like, I don't know how I got around this. Maybe I was just because I was like a little shit when I was a kid. But my parents, you know, being Jewish, obviously, they told me Santa wasn't real like early on. Well, we never did Christmas. Of course. And so when I first oh, like, the heard Christian of the Christian kids, the parents are lying. To them. Like when I first heard about this concept of Christmas, I asked my parents and they're like, oh, they explained to me. And then they're like, oh, Santa isn't real, blah, blah, blah. But like, don't tell any of your friends. No and I way. Didn't. And I didn't. But I wonder like, that's such a weird part of the, of the problem. If you're having, like, if you don't want to tell your kids about Santa, like you have to trust that you're, kid isn't going to go blabbing to everyone else right <laughs> like yeah I'm, but i'm sure like the atheists probably get off on that 
they want their kids. They're like, Santa isn't real and, you know, and go tell everyone. <laughs> May, yeah, maybe, but I'm, I don't, I don't know if it's just atheists. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm assuming there's some Christians out there who tell their kids that, you know, Santa isn't real, but they're not atheists. Really? I'm able to Matt. I don't know. I've never seen polling data on this, but I'm Yeah, imagine. I don't know. But the, I'm sure the second they talk thing I about it on the War on Christmas on Fox, so maybe. But the second thing I wanted to bring up, which is this is very ironic. I mean, Matt is right here, but it's this hugely ironic coming from a very devout religious Christian, right? Right. I mean, he's making all these arguments about reality versus fantasy. You know, should we trust what a kid uh, you know, is able to distinguish between reality and fantasy? And every non Christian is looking at him like bitch like you believe in your own mythology you know very strongly and you're over here sort of trying to use this sort of atheistic arguments in your advantage now that like that this other group of people doesn't like adhere to reality right i mean is he no i know i aware of that me. like how how does he not aware of that listen sitch catholicism is true okay i don't know okay if you know this just Catholicism, not Protestantism. Well, I don't. Protestantism. I, I, I think Protestants. Here, we better look this up. We're going to get in big trouble. Is Matt Walsh a Catholic? Yeah, I don't know what his denomination is at all. I know he's anti yoga because he says it's, you know, it's heretical to do yoga because you're worshiping whatever, whatever, <laughs> supposedly. There's some spiritual aspect of yoga that no one in America follows, basically, but you're still practicing it. He lives in Nashville, Tennessee. Walsh is a Catholic. Okay, okay he is Catholic. Right? Yeah, I thought he was. Yeah, which He's, makes him in the minority, I believe. Seems like. Well, I just I know his his prescriptions on birth control and stuff, and abortion and all that stuff are obviously pretty extreme. So I figured, got to be a Catholic. Well, I think, yeah, but. I think if you look at uh, political breakdown, there's m Catholics are more likely to be Democrats than Republicans. Oh, really? I didn't know. I that. think so. Yeah. That doesn't make a lot of sense to me, but yeah. So I agree. I completely agree with you. You know, obviously the Catholics had a big discussion over whether or not the the sacrament actually turned into the body of Christ, or whether <laughs> or not it remained. <laughs> so yeah, there is a little bit of we have our own our own mythology going right yeah which this is the thing this is the thing that bugs me most of all is that the people most equipped to come in here and say this is all a bunch of nonsense are the atheists but the atheists are sitting down on the side of the blue hair lady well i think the issue is because like the question isn't that he is religious or that he's a theist at all um because i'm a theist the question is if you use your religion to make political arguments i think you sort of lose out on i think you sort of lose the ability to say we should be adhering to objective reality well right? he yeah he doesn't do that specifically in this movie though not There's in this no, video but yeah. he does in his other stuff i mean He's anti-gay marriage completely because of religious reasons, not because of any objective reality question. Right, yeah. No, I understand. He's a terrible ambassador for this whole message. Awful. Maybe mm -hmm. it's good more people don't see this movie. Well, I mean, I'm fine with him being the ambassador. Like, since none of that comes out in the movie, I'm fine with him being the ambassador. I just, I think that having, I think, I think this movie is mostly harmed by the way in which it comes out. You know, you have to go on the Daily Wire website and buy a membership for it. And so there, it doesn't really, it's not able to serve its purpose then of like convincing normies about that maybe some of this stuff is is not great. Like this should, this should have been a movie, if you really want to change hearts and minds, this should have been a movie that came out in theaters, right? That's impossible in the current environment, and you know that. I get, I don't know that. Maybe, maybe not. I mean, that would have been a huge political uh, 
boon to them if they tried to put this out in theaters and theaters were like boycotting this movie saying it was transphobic i mean then they can make a whole big deal about it and be like look you know this is the movie they don't want you to see it just occurred to me that all the left-wing documentaries all get huge theater runs every michael moore movie is like coast to coast you know um the al gore movie an inconvenient truth was in theaters are there any well, mm -hmm. any right-wing movies that make it to movie theaters hell no i don't think so yeah. um i mean to be fair most documentaries don't make it to theaters you know i mean talking about michael moore's like was one of the biggest if not one of, if not the biggest documentary filmmaker for a while mm -hmm. you know when al gore was you know vice president um why is it two thousand mules in theaters yeah, exactly <laughs> and I, I would i would assume that the reason they didn't go for theater release is financial not you know because it's very expensive and it, uh, this movie probably wouldn't make a lot of money back at theaters it just i just don't think it serves the purpose of what he wants to serve which would be to convince normies in the way it's being released because no normie is going to go sign up for a daily wire account right but anyway let's actually watch the clip i would say that as a pediatrician and as a parent i would say how wonderful my four-year-old and their imagination is you know one of the hardest things as we did this film uh especially <laughs> wait, wait, interviewing wait, 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 wait. somebody wait, 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 wait. to someone who can't distinguish between fantasy and reality when i see a child who you know believes in santa claus and then let's say this is a boy and he says i'm a girl mm -hmm. this is someone who can't distinguish between fantasy and reality so how could you take that as a reality i would say that as a pediatrician and as a parent i would say how wonderful my four-year-old and their imagination is you know one of the hard <laughs> i hope the god that she gave like a better answer and they just cut it out <laughs> because like that's an insane like that's an insane answer to give it is it's totally insane so i don't know was there anything else in the clip you wanted to well, we can watch more of the clip if you want. Okay. That's what makes me male. Feel yourself going slightly insane. So it was a pretty bewildering exchange there, but it only gets weirder from here. Let's keep watching. Male gametes. That's what makes me male. No, your, your sperm don't make you male. Then what does? It's a constellation. In reality, in truth, okay? Whose truth are we talking about? The same truth that says we're sitting in this room right now, you and I. No. You're not listening. If I, if I see a chicken laying eggs and I say that's a female chicken laying eggs, did I assign female or am I just observing a physical reality that's happening in the world? Does a chicken have gender identity? Does a chicken cry? Well, a Does chi a chicken commit suicide? Let's frame it. Because you're talking, you're trying well, a chicken to... chicken has sex like any, like any biological organism. A chicken has organism. an assigned gender, but a chicken doesn't have a gender identity. So we assign female to chickens when they lay eggs? That's a, we that's... assume they're female if they lay eggs. That right there will uh, go down for me as... <laughs> okay. <laughs> All this stuff around gender identity. The, I'm so torn. Oh I am God. so I am so torn because, you know me, I'm just... I'm, I get interested in things, and I am fascinated by the whole topic, but you just... Mm -hmm. You can't talk to people about this stuff because they're so up their own asses in this whole ideology that... Right. It's like you have to, they completely treat it like a religion. Like, no, this is, this is the way that you have to believe. And we're not exploring these ideas. You know, we're not trying to figure out what's true and what's not, or right. come to any real knowledge about the topic. You know, you've signed up for a cult. Right. And yeah. I mean, I mean that, that woman is a moron, obviously. And she is in this cult. I mean, Chickens don't have gender. I hate to be the I hate to be the bearer yeah. of bad news. Yes, most animals don't have gender. I mean, maybe no animal has gender or anything that can be conceived of as gender beyond humans. Yeah, you know, just, just chickens. Let alone chickens. I mean, birds. Birds. You don't think of the birds have very different plumage depending upon right. sex. They have. Yeah, animals have sex. Isn't that their gender sex. expression? Well, okay, well, <laughs> but then it gets into the problem of how exactly is gender being defined. Right. Right. Do you know that there's like, a bird that 
it does this very very elaborate dance to entice mm-hmm. the female into mating yes and that while it's doing this while it's learning this elaborate dance it apprentices under someone that has mastered the dance and is almost ready to like get some yes i have seen <laughs> that video of that i forget what's called that there's a bird that had like young right. male birds will assist yes old, like older male birds in, in doing the weird dance yeah dance in order to learn how to do the dance right yeah. so it's completely culturally taught that's so bizarre yeah why are why isn't this lady outraged that they're being forced into this gender <laughs> identity box just so that they can get some female bird action there you go some bussy See, this is, I just, <laughs> some pussy, some bird pussy. <laughs> some, oh, oh, I guess maybe should, should it be boeka? Some of that get me that boeka. <laughs> some bird. Anyway. Oh, because they, they don't have a pussy, do they? No, they have the, I guess oh, saying, yeah, I, say, right. I guess saying boeka is kind of redundant. Right? Birds, birds have one hole for everything. One hole for everything. <laughs> Which is terrible, but yeah, no, I just, the whole idea this this is this is the thing that bothers me most because if you're talking about gender identity like as soon as you bring up evolution which is a pertinent mm-hmm. topic to sexual selection these people right. blow a gasket because that makes their whole entire ideology just tumble to the ground um yeah but that's why i mean they don't it it seems like most of these people, and this would be an interesting conversation. Maybe we should try booking some of these people on the show because I love talking about this. Um, yeah, I, can you though? I mean, I, I guess know, we have to find. Yeah, we can like, try. Like random, like random <laughs> sex doctors, because yeah, like it seems like at least on the on the internets. I don't know how the doctors uh, break out, but on the internets, most of the people that I've talked to, and I don't know if they're just doing it for the sake of the argument or not. They basically ascribe to a blank slate model of human behavior or they say there's very little uh you know evolution has a very little impact on behavior is basically the position they take which is insane yeah which is an insane position to take and if, if like science is going completely in the opposite direction like they're more and more yes. thinking evolution and psychology are strongly linked right well this is what you know it kind of came up in our conversation our last conversation with carl which is you know, the, like a lot of these, you know, in the 60s, it was very easy for a lot of these leftist theories and academics to latch on to science because science of psychology at that moment was very fixated on conditioning and everything being taught and societal and behavioral. And so they kind of were able to, to claim the science card. Then the problem is, you know, 10, 20 years later, when science starts going in the exact opposite direction, yeah, saying, know. you know, you know, more and more research is being done and understanding on DNA and genetics, and suddenly it's like, well, wait a minute, maybe this is, you know, a lot of this is biological. And they didn't, you know, all these academic fields for reasons that are probably self-serving didn't update their scientific theories. They're still working off of these very old scientific theories that are have all been debunked. Sound familiar? I mean, is this exactly what happened with evolution in the catholic church i feel it like is, it yeah did. exactly yeah it, that's exactly what happened yeah all right let's watch a, a little bit more of the clip and then we'll which okay. does the medical transition begin with uh medication so medical affirmation begins when the patient says they're ready for it so that could be a, a kiddo who is just starting puberty a kiddo and panicking because they're getting breast buds or their penis is getting bigger and busier and they're worried about all kinds of masculine changes and that way puberty blockers which are completely reversible and don't have permanent effects are wonderful because that's a fucking big ass claim she just made Mm -hmm. that's a big ass claim without a lot of evidence Mm -hmm. so we can put that pause on puberty just like if you were listening to music you put the pause on and we stop the blockers and puberty would go right back to where it was. The next note in the song just delayed that period of time. So this is the part, this is the part. And so I, I hate, I've heard, like, obviously I've never been to a gender doctor, but I've heard doctors 
describe medicine in these very simplistic ways before. And it's very upsetting because it's almost always bullshit. Totally. They're, they're like, yeah. oh, it's just, it's just something very simple. You know, like this is like when I was, you know, on the, the protein pump inhibitors for heartburn and stuff. They're like, oh yeah, just, you know, just prevents stomach acid. And it's like, okay, that also prevents you from digesting your food, but they don't tell you that. Right? Like, you know, this, I just, this idea like, oh, yeah, puberty is so easy. We just press a pause button like a CD and then, right. you know, you start up again. It's like, okay, I, I'm very skeptical that it's that simple. It's, it's very, it's very sad too, because in order to get informed consent for any of these procedures, the doctor gives you exactly the spiel that she just laid out. And then they yes. drop a stack of forms on you. Right. That right. it's your obligation to read through and know all the stuff and right. then sign your life away as right. far as informed consent goes. It's just, it's, it's totally unconscionable. Well, and also it's, it's annoying too, because even the metric of the example that she uses is so, so piss poor. Like, I mean, anyone that's had sex had, I'm sure has had the same, like your body is developing and you feel uncomfortable about it. Like that's just, just a common thing. Like, Oh, some you know kids going through puberty and yeah it comes with discomfort <laughs> right they're uncomfortable with the changes to their body that's like the literally the right. stereotype of going through puberty so how is that a metric that can be used to describe you know gender dysphoria yeah it's terrible i can't that's crazy there's lupron right which mm -hmm. has actually been used to chemically castrate sex offenders you know what I'm not sure that we should continue with this interview because it seems like it's well, so, going in a particular direction. Well, you're a medical professional. I am a medical professional. So you don't want to talk about the drugs that you give to kids or? Again, I'm a physician and I use medication. You're choosing exploitive words, drugs I give to I'm, kids. I'm choosing a chemical word concern. that was in a dictionary. That's not a correct term for puberty blocking. I, mean, I could like look it up on my phone, but I'm pretty sure if I looked it up like, you you can look it up on your phone. It says medical definition, the administration of a drug to bring about a marked reduction in the body's production of androgens and especially testosterone. And I'm saying, as a pediatrician who takes care of hundreds of these kids, when you use that terminology, you are being malignant and harmful. I mean, there are some who... Who's being malignant and harmful here? She, right. I just feel... Well, <laughs> this is... Well, it, this is, I mean, it's, it's, well, there's two things going on. First of all, th it is a, f a completely fair question. Um, if this is a drug used for chemical castration, I mean, assumingly it's used in different amounts and it has some different effect than used in the purpose of puberty blockers. I would imagine, right? I and think it's could, an off-label use. Technically, the puberty, right, but the I'm whole puberty like, blockers thing is off-label use. Yeah, but is it the same pro Well, I guess the question that she should address Maybe it is. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's literally the same process. I think it I is. I Maybe think that's why is. she doesn't yeah. want to address the question. Um, you know what off-label use is, right? Yeah. It's just, yeah. Exactly. It's not. It hasn't been FDA approved. It's exactly. Just, right. Yes. But well, because I mean, I don't know. Maybe I don't know. I thought chemical castration was permanent, effectively, um, where she's claiming puberty blockers are not permanent. And so that's why I'm saying I don't know if it has the same effect or is used they in the same way as a different amount. They don't have studies to, I don't, to know right, that. That's something that she needs to address. She's so not going to address it. She's going to freak I know, out. I know. Uh, but to be fair, to, to to be fair to her point, her one, her specific point is that um, he did say giving drugs to children, which obviously has a connotation. To Instead <laughs> of saying giving medication to children. Instead of saying prescribing medicine or prescribing, right. even, even saying prescribing drugs to kids. You know, we say, oh, you're giving drugs to children. Like, right, obviously, yeah. yeah. And, you know, he's playing like obtuse, but, you know, right. whatever. You're selling drugs to school children. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's obviously the end. Yeah. I would say that giving chemical castration drugs to kids is malignant and harmful. It's about the context of caring for a child and, and seeing the, the suffering that kids can have that have not been in affirmative home situations. So that was the part in... All right. We don't need Matt Walsh's commentary. You got any yeah. closing thoughts before you move on? Um, no, I, th I think. Uh, we'll see if there's any super chats related to this. Uh, Dr. Diller for $2 says... 
The Matt Walsh documentary was interesting because on most other issues, Matt Walsh would be horribly wrong, but he's working with such an obvious set of facts that he can't help it. I came away disliking him more despite largely agreeing with him. There yeah. you go. Uh, Stug for $3 says, I'm like 11 minutes behind, but it seems obvious to me that if you simply remove the affirmative care model for dysphoria and allow only dysphoric people to use insurance or whatever for, tra- for transitioning, then go ahead and pay your own money to transition. No, none of this would be happening if we didn't have the affirmative care model and they were really you know, trying to weed out false positives and you were only, because the number of transitions would be so much lower and it would only be people who had serious issues. All of this is just, because the medical community has kind of been ideologically captured by political activists, which Mm -hmm. is scary. It really is. No, yeah, exactly, exactly. I mean, it's happened before. The, the, The religious right, you know, they've tried to, capture schools for years for prayer in public school and to get evolution out all kinds of different things yeah well and then i mean and we get into this realm because i think you and i we and a lot of our audience we kind of inhibit or not inhabit inhabit this minority position where you know i'm not against uh people transitioning i just think it's probably being way over done way over prescribed and it seems like the majority positions are either like all in on one side or the other. Like, oh, it's all fine. Everything's fine. You know, there's no false positives or there's false positives are tiny. They're not worth talking about. And the other side is no one should transition. It seems like these are the two majority positions. And and Matt Walsh even did himself a, a disservice because he just tweeted out very recently that no one should be transitioning at all. Right. So now all the people can just say, oh, see, Matt Walsh's documentary is just concern trolling. It's all bullshit. He just doesn't want anyone to transition. Blah 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 blah. Science doesn't matter here. You know. Blah 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 blah. They don't. So yeah, his position. He's as ideologically possessed as the person he's sitting across from. That's why it's just. He's a terrible messenger well, for this. <laughs> this will come up when we talk to Charlotte again. Um, this came up in her conversation with with Vosh, where Vosh. Uh, talks about people being morally lucky, which right. I agree with this concept, which is basically that people were just born either biologically with their moral intuitions or born in the right family where they're basically socialized to have their morals be in some direction. And so they're born. So if they're, if you agree with that person, you're like, well, they're morally lucky. They didn't necessarily like, you know, have a long introspective thought process where they decide to come to the correct, uh, moral decision right and i think that's the kind of same thing with matt walsh is like i agree far more with matt walsh's position on this than i agree with blue haired lady uh, obviously way more on matt walsh's side of things but to me it's as you said it's i think it's just it's just luck that he's sort of on the right side or the more of the right side of the issue right yeah so do you care if uh, we invite el Stoffo on to watch his of video? course not yeah. Of okay. Not. Cool. Uh, Dennis for ten dollars says it's meant to introduce lunatic experts, blue-haired professors that say some insane things that people of their caliber shouldn't touch with a ten-foot pole, and slowly introduce more crazy things. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. No. I mean, they all. They all. It's funny. Most of them are communists and want to flatten hierarchies, but they all like to throw out. I'm a PhD pediatrician. <laughs> <laughs> We should trust the experts, but flatten all higher. Yeah, exactly. So, mm. so uh, human beings are full of contradictions. I mean, it's of a, course, it's very difficult to avoid them. So, at least some, at least we're trying, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Is that it, or any more super chats? Yeah, that's it. Okay. Uh, about that topic. Hi, you just listened to a clip from the Sitch and Adam show. If you like what you heard, you can listen to our live show right here on this channel on Sunday, starting at 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern. And if you want, you can super chat us. We read $20 and up super chats on the show and then do a follow-up stream on the following Tuesday where we read the rest of the unread super chats and interact with fans of the show. Subscribe to this channel right here to listen to the live show or to listen to more of our awesome clips.